What would you do to ensure the safety of your family? Anything, everything. In a dystopian future, Cherie Demoline asks those questions in The Marrow Thieves, and she's here tonight to talk about how this young adult novel has critics raving and won over a lot of folks of a certain age, like myself. And we're very pleased to welcome Cherie Demoline to our studio tonight. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so I haven't been a young adult for a couple decades now, um, <laughs> but I really enjoyed this book. Thank you. Why did you write this specifically for young adults? You know, when the story came out, I was originally asked a couple of years ago to write uh, a short story for a science fiction, indigenous-specific anthology that Thetis Books was putting out. Um, and I thought at first, oh, God, I don't know if I can do this. I don't write science fiction. Um, you know, did this sort of this dystopian or speculative idea of literature. Um, and then this story started to, to, to come across in the voice of Frenchie and, and this idea of indigenous kids in the future. And it was definitely kids. It was a young voice. Um, and so when the short story was finished and the characters kept living on, um, I knew it was going to be a larger book. Um, and when that first draft was done, my publisher said, what do you want now? Like, we can, it can go either way. Do you want adult, young adult? You know, normally I'm more comfortable with adult books, because that's all I've written. Um, but there was something about that story I thought, you know what? Like, our young people need to have this. Not just Indigenous young people, so that they can see themselves in the future, but Canadian kids, so that they can understand at such a critical age. What do you want them to understand? You know, that, and I, so I, I want them to understand that, you know, um, these, there's been some very troubled history in Canada. I want them to not shy away from that. And I want them to know that they are absolutely empowered to make changes, to make sure that these issues, these horrible things don't happen again. And the great thing is, is that uh, that's happening. And I, and I really, you know, I thought, I'm not going to be naive about this. I'm going to bring this story out in the best way possible and, you know, really carry it forward with as much honor as I can on behalf of the community. Um, but I'm walking into Canadian classrooms, and these kids are reading the book and saying to me, you know, how can I be a better ally without taking up space in an Indigenous, you know, centered conversation? But you also wrote it for Indigenous youth as well. Yes. You wanted them to be, to felt seen. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I spent a lot of years uh, working in communities, in First Nations communities, uh, mostly in Ontario. And I was working with youth who w didn't even have the language of seeing themselves in the future. And I thought, well, you know, if you don't see a world where you exist, then I'm, I'm going to build one. I'm going to put you there. And I mean, the book has resonated with, you know, people like me, mm -hmm. older people, <laughs> critics. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to show the audience the book, mm -hmm. um, the front of the book, all the awards that you've received thus far. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are made it to the Canada Reads shortlist, mm -hmm. a Governor General Literary Award winner, the Kirkus Prize, which is from the US, yeah. uh, a Global Mail Best Book, and the White Pine Award. Mm -hmm. um, this is your fourth novel, right? It is, yeah. Why do you think this book has garnered this kind of attention? You know, I think because it talks about so many issues. I mean, really coming into this, I put everything in it. And there was a moment where I thought, is this too much? Like, have I gone too far? Because there was just so many issues. Um, but it was the one time when I was writing, I didn't hold back. I really, you know, I want to talk about, you know, the position of religion and, and new age spirituality within the community context. I want to talk about connection to language and how language holds understandings that English just can't. I wanted to talk about residential schools. I wanted to talk about family and, and making our own family. Um, and so I sort of, I just, I put everything in and, didn't really think that it was going to, you know, have a huge audience, but I thought when it lands, it will be impactful. And again, is if it impacts Indigenous youth, then I'm good. That's that's fine with me. Well, there's this uh, a wonderful part in the book where the children eagerly tell the elders, mm -hmm. uh, "It's time for story." Mm -hmm. How? Where does your love of words and language come from? Mm -hmm. Um, I was really blessed. I grew up with my grandmother and her sisters. Um, our community is uh, it's a Métis community on the Georgian Bay, and it's about a, like across the bay from the town of Penetanguishene. Mm -hmm. So really what's known as cottage country, but we've been there for a long time since the community was moved from Drummond Island. Um, so I grew up with these old ladies and their stories, and they constantly told stories. And I remember being very young and thinking, God, everyone else gets to go out and play, and I'm stuck with these old women, and they just want to talk to me and tell me these you know, gossipy stories. But what they were doing was making sure that 
uh, the stories of our community on that land, from when we were in Drummond Island, from when parts of our family were on the Red River in Manitoba, that those stories were passed along. So really, I was raised from a very young age to not just appreciate story, but to carry story. So it's been my absolute honor, and it's been a huge part of my life. And you write everywhere. Um, yes. I read a story about how one time one of your relatives told you to go outside and play. Yes. <laughs> but instead you did what? I, so that was my mother and she was, it was the summer and I was inside reading and scribbling as they called it. And um, she said, you know what, just go outside and play. It's a beautiful day, go. And so I did, I went. I was living in North Bay at the time and I was riding my bike. Um, and I got down to the lake and I had this great idea for a story. Luckily, I kept a pen in my bun uh, but I had no paper, so I wrote the story on the bottoms of my shoes because the soles were white, and then like pedaled back home on the side of my feet. Yeah. You, even, uh, you even wrote when you were going through labor with your three kids and on your wedding day. Absolutely, all the time. What does writing mean to you? Everything, everything. It's, um, I feel like, and there's a, a Dutch French writer, Anais Nin wrote mm -hmm. that she didn't feel that things, that she was living life until she had written about what happened later. So even in that moment, she was collecting the fodder for the story or the poem or whatever that would come later. Um, and I really feel that, that a lot of the time it's about listening and recording and carrying it so that you have a moment later to sit down with that material and organize it and to put it out in a way that um, is, is consumable but beautiful, even even if it's brutal, that it's beautiful in that moment for whoever's going to receive it. And how does your background, how does your identity as being mm. Métis inform mm. your writing? Um, it absolutely informs every part of my writing. And I have this conversation a lot um, in the literary world, in the academic world, where they say, well, you know, how do you feel about being pigeonholed or, you know, just being considered an Indigenous writer? You know, is, is, it that, is that weird? Is it the same as being, you know, somebody would not want to be called, say, a gay writer or a black writer? Like, that's limiting. Mm. Um, and I agree, there are, you know, certain uh, edges to that box that you're put in that, that aren't always great, that you want to just be considered a wider, uh, you know, sort of have to have wider appeal or not to be boxed in. Um, but for me, because we are the people of story, because we've carried oral tradition, because it's such a high honor in the community to carry those stories, um, it, it is absolutely everything about how I write. It's the language I use, um, it's the structure of the story. Um, in the book, uh, there's coming to stories, so every time a, a character is introduced or when there's a moment, we'll hear the, the character's background. And the way that that was structured is, is a very indigenous way of telling stories. It's, it's, we call it Indian geography. It's how we figure out who we're related to and where we're from and what our traditions are. So, you know, everything about the way that I write, even in, a, you know, this Western context of publishing books, absolutely relates to my community. But it's also important for you not to, you know, within the Indigenous community, yeah. you say that there are, very, there are many stories within yeah. the, that belong to different people within that community, and that's absolutely. important for you to make a distinction. It's everything. It's absolutely crucial, and we yeah. see this coming out a, a lot more. We have issues of, you know, who has permission to tell what story um, and what the protocols are. And not only, you know, some of the stories are only told at certain times of year. Um, sometimes you have to go through an enormous training to be able to carry certain stories. And other than that, I mean, there's just the stories that belong to other families. It's, it's you know, it's just, you would never tell somebody else's story. You would never sing somebody else's song. Um, and so for me, I'm very careful um, with how I tell them and what stories I tell and, and even how I tell them. So I spend a lot of time with um, my adopted auntie, Lee Maracle, who was one of the first Indigenous women, first Indigenous people to be published um, in the 70s. And, you know, I carry a lot of her stories. She knows that I tell her stories. I never tell them as my own. I mm -hmm. introduce her, her family, where their territory is from, and then tell that story with her permission. But it's just, it's not just about respect, it's about survival because it's how we've come this far. I don't want to give away too much of the book, but if you could tell us, what is The Marrow Thieves about? What in this apocalypse that you've created? Right, so, and it sounds dark, but I promise it's not all dark. Um, so it's about 30, 40 years in the future. And I have to interrupt myself to say, when I was writing this book, I really thought I was writing a, a story that, you know, took place, you know, like 100 years in the future. Um, and then the Americans <laughs> elected Donald Trump. And I realized, oh, wait, no, let's just move that timeline up. Because I was talking about things like, you know, the government has sort of gone rogue. They've lost the confidence of the people. 
Um, there's been a lot of cataclysmic climate change because it was denied for so long. Mm -hmm. um, the north is melting, the water levels are rising, and as a result, um, you know, the, the coastlines and the very continents are changing shape. So pieces are breaking off, they're being submerged. Cities are being swallowed up. Exactly, yeah. and so people have to migrate. Um, and so, of course, this brings to mind the, the first migration into these sort of empty areas or what was known as Indian territory. So again, what would happen if all of these people who lived in the coastlines had to move in? And there would be a lot of sickness because of, you know, the, the new environment. And so in this time, one of the... Uh, one of the consequences of all of this change and disruption has been that people have lost the ability to dream. Um, and we know that if you cannot dream, there's a lot of very serious mental health implications because we do a lot of processing while we're dreaming. Um, and so the general population now becomes incredibly ill um, because they cannot dream, which makes them, renders them a bit ungovernable. So the government has to find a way to reinstate that ability to dream. They discover that North American indigenous people have not lost that ability, that they are still dreaming. And it's rumored that it's housed in the marrow of our bones. The then, story is told uh, the, in the future. Yes. But it also feels like it's uh, maybe like a narrative that's already happened in the past. Absolutely. So, so um, part of the storyline is that uh, realizing that indigenous people can dream, the government now has to do this work, this horrible work of collecting the population uh, and housing them somewhere um, so that they can do uh, the experiments to figure out how to extract the ability so that they can give it to the general population. And so they think, okay, we need a place where we can round up all of these community members, we can put them there, we can house them. Um, and of course, you know, dreams being a metaphor for hope, they need to find a place where even in this horrible place where this work is happening, they won't lose that ability until they, they have, want to extract it. Um, and they realize that they've done this already. They've already successfully been able to round up people and keep them somewhere. And you know, even in that place, the community re retained their dreams, and that was residential schools. And so they reopen and rebuild uh, residential schools in order to extract dreams. And the story is centered around uh, a young Métis boy by the name mm -hmm. of Frenchie. Yeah. Um, and he meets along the way a group of people who become his family. Yeah. I just don't want to give away too much. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but the younger members of that group uh, don't seem to know a lot about what they call old-timey ways. Mm -hmm. uh, why are they so disconnected from their indigenous culture? Mm -hmm. So some of the younger members uh, of, of Frenchie's new family were born in the time, uh, you know, after the, the cataclysmic change, after, you know, America's invaded Canada for fresh water. So they've been born in that tumultuous time when the new migration happened and communities were broken up and a lot of the, you know, their, their parents were stolen from them. So it's, it's really looking at, like, our stolen generations, our kids that were lost. And within these younger members is, is such incredible hope. There's a lot of answers in these kids, and a lot of the strength of the group comes from the younger members. So even though they have that sort of immediacy in their disconnect with community, their, their, um, their roots are, are very deep. And it really speaks to those people in our community that were taken away, but who have done tremendous work in coming home. And one of the elders in the group is mm -hmm. Miguans. Is that my, yeah, my saying it right? Yep. Miguans. Yep. Um, and I'd like to read something that you wrote. Sure. Um, so you write, we go to the schools and they leech the dreams from where our ancestors hid them in the honeycombs of slushy marrow buried in our bones. Mm -hmm. And us, well, we join our ancestors hoping we left enough dreams behind for the next generation to stumble across. Mm -hmm. We talked a little bit about dreams, but mm -hmm. what does a world without dreams look like? Mm -hmm. um, I think there's, you know, there's a reference in, in the book to, um, to mechanics, how essentially humans become machines without dreams. It's, it's, it really is, it houses, they house our dreams, our, sorry, they house our, our hope. Um, they carry our understanding of what we've already lived and they give us an idea of where we're going. Um, and so for me, when I was, when I was writing the book, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't know how I was going to talk about these issues and, and um, really that idea of having dreams be the vehicle that carry all of that everything that we've lived through and everything that we're going towards came forward and it was a perfect way to to talk about those stories. And I think one of the most beautiful sentences I've ever read is at the end of the book when mm -hmm. you kind of 
pull everything together. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, if you could, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to ask you to read a passage from the book. For sure. Um, and I've made uh, the marking there. Okay. From where we were now, running, looking at reality from this one point in time, it seemed as though the world had suddenly gone mad, poisoning your own drinking water, changing the air so much the earth shook and melted and crumbled, harvesting a race for medicine. How? How could this happen? Were they that much different from us? Would we be like them if we'd had a choice? Were they like us enough to let us live? Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Um, the characters have to make a lot of moral decisions mm -hmm. uh, that haunt them. Mm -hmm. At one point, they ask, uh, what separates us from the recruiters? And mm -hmm. the recruiters are the people who are in search of them for the, uh, yeah. for the marrow. Yeah. Um, in the end, aren't we all just trying to survive? Mm -hmm. And so this is where uh, the title of the book comes from. Uh, it's two separate pieces. And the, the, the central idea of the book, but tied into the title, uh, comes from two different experiences that I had. So one, uh, when I was in my 20s yesterday. Um, <laughs> Same. Right? <laughs> I saw you there. Yeah. Um, I was at the Friendship Center in Toronto, and I was with the youth group, and we were very angry. You know, rightfully so. There was a lot of, there's a, there is a lot of continuing issues happening. So, you know, we were angry about, you know, there was all of these new laws that were going to be changed, and, um, you know, looking at missing and murdered Indigenous women and just even issues of, of you know, clean drinking water in our communities and, and even funding for the programs that we wanted to run. So we were very angry um, and we were shouting around and we had a visitor um, who was a, an Inuk elder from Nunavut. Uh, his name was Anyangyak. And he was sitting there and he kind of had the smile on his face and he just listened for a bit and then he said, wait, can I just ask a question? Who are you so angry at? And we said, well, well, we're angry at Canada, like we're angry at the man, right? Like this unidentified the man. And, um, you know, there's, there's so many issues happening and it, it makes us really vocal and very angry and, and we want to take action. Mm -hmm. And he said, that's fair, that's absolutely. But in all of this, you know, you need to follow our teachings and one of those teachings is compassion. You need to have compassion. And we said, well, of course we have compassion. We have compassion for our people. That's why we're, we're angry. And he said, Maybe what you need to do is take a second and have compassion for the people that you're angry with. Which didn't go over very well, you know. We're like, mm -hmm. oh no, we need to put bandanas on and take to the streets. Um, and he said, just when people left Europe, when they left their lands, they weren't leaving a beautiful place. They weren't leaving ideal situations. Um, you know, women were being, you know, burned and murdered and, and called witches and the pagans were being driven out and murdered, the druids had disappeared. So what you're looking at is a society who had killed their medicine people, who had lost their elders. So basically, you know, you're talking about fighting, um, you're talking about these people as if it, we, it was a warrior society that came over here and really what it was was a boat full of children. And when children are left without boundaries or guidance, they can be quite brutal because they'll do anything to survive. Because they have no history to look they back They have on. no history. There's no connection. There's no looking forward. They can't see anything. There's no connection backwards. So it's just survival. Mm -hmm. And when you, you know, are forced to survive, you'll do just about anything. Um, so then years later, I was in uh, the Northwest Territories with a group of Indigenous women writers. Um, and we were doing ceremony and we were sharing stories. And uh, there was one woman there from Alberta, Kelly Benning, and she, we were talking, and we weren't talking about anything, you know, sacred. We were talking about how horrible it was to be pregnant. <laughs> you know, just like, everyone says it's such a beautiful gift, but man, it's just the worst. Agreed. Right? <laughs> <laughs> there, it's horrible. <laughs> and she said, um, she said, you know, it's because at that point when you're carrying them, they got no love for you. Like, they're trying to survive, and they'll do anything to survive. They'll, they leach the vitamins out of your bones. Mm -hmm. They're just the most adorable marrow thieves. And so, you know, that one went away, and I, I sort of put the two together thinking about, you know, the book is about, absolutely it's about Indigenous people, and it's about our survival, and it's from our worldview and our perspective, and it's about our strength. But it's also talking about that wider human conversation of what we would do to survive. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of ways, it's offering up a gift from the Indigenous community to say, you know, we've gone through this together. We're all just trying to survive now at this time in the future. Maybe if we follow traditional knowledge, maybe if we look at indigenous worldview, philosophy, science, and stories, that is the way forward for us all. 
Because being young is important, but also being older is vitally important. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, Frenchie talks about the old-timey ways, but it mm. seems that when we're young, we do dismiss the knowledge our mm. elders have. Um, mm. What do we lose as a, as a society when we do this? Mm -hmm. um, everything. So I'll tell you, uh, in terms of my family, my grandmother and her sisters were the last people in our community to speak uh, the dialect of language. So um, they speak Michif, or they spoke Michif, which was uh, a very old French Canadian with some Anishinaabe Moan, Ojibwe, because that's the territory that our community is situated in, and uh, Cree. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the newest languages in the world, or it is the newest language in the world, Michif, but um, already we're losing it. So when my Grandmother passed, and you know, I heard this language growing up. The stories were told to me in Michif and in English, and I took it for granted. Mm -hmm. So, because I took it for granted, I answered in English. I didn't, when they talked to me, I conversed back in English, didn't really think much about it. When my uh, great auntie died about six years ago, she was the last speaker of that dialect, and so now it's gone from the community. So now, um, that's you know, a loss, that's a it's tremendous loss. A huge loss, because part of that is the understanding that, you know, my grandmother told me. Um, because now, now my family speaks, you know, the, um, there's a, La Fontaine is a community that we're situated in and around, and it's a French-Canadian uh, community, and so we speak that same kind of French that they have, or, you know, they do. I still am the jerk that only speaks English. Um, but my grandmother explained it as this. Um, in the language, there are words. When we say those words, it's not identifying the thing. Mm -hmm. It's identifying the relationship of that thing to everything around it. So how it connects or doesn't connect. And so sometimes there's not translations. And so we lose uh, more than we think. So I thought, oh, I'm losing that beautiful, you know, musical sound of those old women. But really, I'm losing the understanding of how, in our worldview, we connect to the things around us. Um, we only have a few more minutes left. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's gone by so quickly. Um, I would like to read something else from your book. Yes. Um, so you write, I'll never forget the way that man looked when they tossed his grandson in the back of a van like a bag of rice. I watched his soul fold up on itself like a closing door. The light and warmth and humanity clapped shut in his eyes because he couldn't protect the one thing that mattered. Mm -hmm. There was no coming back from that, even if he did manage to walk away later on, which he wouldn't. Was this scene and others where family members are separated an allegory? Mm -hmm. um, really, those, those, so those scenes where I'm <laughs> doing that horrible work of ripping apart families in the book to get at you know, what it was like in community when you know, there was, we went through the 60s scoop and residential schools and, um, and a lot of people, like Métis families, where you know, they were on the road allowance, we were sort of scattered all over. Um, it was incredibly difficult to write, and I wanted to talk about uh, about that loss and about that rending, and to, to give you know to put it into the context of this is it's so serious and it changes the very fabric of how of how we relate of how we move forward, but we still move forward. So in each one of those scenes, it was it was about tearing a family or a community down to its bones. But then, of course, the understanding that the, the importance of it is, is still there is because it's in the marrow. And to keep moving forward. To keep moving forward, which we have. Um, yeah. We're seeing more and more Indigenous stories mm -hmm. uh, being published in Canada. Yeah. What would you attribute that to? Well, for the first time ever, we have three full generations of published Indigenous writers. It's never happened before in our history. We have the original people, you know, like Maria Campbell and like uh, Lee Miracle, who came first. We have sort of that middle generation, like myself and, you know, Gregory Schofield and Eden Robinson. And we have these beautiful, fearless Indigenous youth that are writing now, like, Joshua Whitehead and Alicia Elliott, like just incredible voices. And so for the first time, we have three full generations. So we're surrounded again by that idea of youth and, and elders, of, of dreams and hopes. And so now we're at the time where we have gathered so much strength um, that there's an opening up where it's not just for us, it's not just us sort of in a huddle um, keeping those stories alive, whispering into each other. It's us standing somewhere to shout it so that everyone can hear. As I mentioned before, um, the book was shortlisted for Canada Reads. Mm -hmm. um, and Julie Black, the singer, defended your book. Oh, she did fantastic. She did. And yeah. she said, one of the things that she said uh, over and over was that she believes that this book should be part of the syllabus in Canada and mm -hmm. uh, it should be made available in schools so mm -hmm. children can read it, kids can read it. Uh, do you agree? 
That's the dream. Absolutely, mm -hmm. that is the dream. Um, you know, there's a lot of dark uh, areas in the book. It talks about history, but it's our history as Canada. Um, and I know that there's, a, there's been um, some concern where people say, well, you know, should kids be hearing about residential schools? Should kids be talking about, you know, uh, families being torn apart or violence? Um, and to that I say this, I, th I think, you know, Canadian parents need to give their kids some credit. I'm having conversations with these kids. They're brilliant. Um, they're on it. They're, they're good. And the other thing I would say is, you know, in terms of um, the separation between the communities, our kids don't have the choice of whether or not to learn this. This is reality for a lot of Indigenous youth. So if our kids can get it, and they're good, and they're brilliant, and they're beautiful, then have faith that your kids can too. Um, dystopian uh, film, television books is really mm -hmm. popular. Mm -hmm. Could you see this being made into a movie? Because I could. <laughs> <laughs> uh, absolutely, absolutely. And we've had discussions with producers yeah. about uh, moving forward. And the, the two things um, that I've said uh, moving forward is, one, that this book, if it is going to become a TV series or a movie, must remain Indigenous. It's not the Maze Runner, it's not Harry Potter. It, these kids have to be Indigenous because that is the worldview and the gift of the book, is the stories come from our community. And two, that the main love story in the book must be between these two men, mm -hmm. that it can't be switched to, you know, sort of this heteronormative narrative. So, you know, I'm moving forward with it very carefully because I understand that you know, my intent, whatever my intent was with the book, and it did come from a good place, but it means nothing now compared to how people have embraced it. And so it's their story. So I need to sort of guard it in the best way that I can. Sheree, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Nam. It was fun. Such a good book. Thank you. I bawled at the end. <laughs> oh, no, like, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>